welcome our next speakers, Joseph and Ilya, who will be talking about how bootloaders are broken and how to sort of look into them. Please give them a warm round of applause. Uh, hello, does this uh, sound okay? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome to Boot to Root, uh, auditing bootloaders by example. Um, Joseph Tartaro, I uh, hack things for IOActive, and uh, this is my uh, second time at Congress, so I'm uh, really excited to be back here. Hi, uh, I'm Ilya. Um, this is my 18th or 19th time at Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be back here, too. Uh, <laughs> I've spoken here, I think, seven or eight times before. Um, and I'm very excited to um, speak here together with Joe. Uh, we've been working together on bootloaders the last year and change. Uh, and this is, uh, minus the NDA coverage stuff, this is some of the things we've observed and seen. So I'm very excited to do this. Uh, yeah, so uh, the expected uh, audience for this talk would be uh, embedded systems engineers, uh, security people who are interested in embedded systems, and just curious security people. Um, just a, a caveat. Uh, we're going to be quickly going through about like 70 slides or so, and a lot of it's just like examples of uh, C source code. So if you did not realize you were signing up for an hour of that, uh, feel free to walk out. We're not going to be offended. Um, and then an another caveat would be um, this isn't really trying to, to flex and show, look at all the bugs we found. Uh, the purpose of this was to kind of show people, hey, if you have not looked at bootloaders before, this is our recommended, uh, you know, areas of attack surface that are interesting. This is probably where you should get started. Um, and in some examples of uh, nobody's really looking at them and uh, they should start. So uh, that's pretty much uh, what's going to go on right now. Uh, so quickly, uh, here's the agenda. Uh, we'll discuss uh, quote unquote bootloaders, uh, why they're important, uh, some of the common ones we looked at, uh, attack surface, and our conclusions. So um, there's going to be a wide interpretation of uh, bootloader. So basically what we mean by that is anything that's in your uh, secure boot chain. And uh, if you don't have experience with these or uh, you haven't looked at them much, uh, you can kind of think of it uh, like from an operating system standpoint of user land calling into kernel space. You'll, you'll have like kind of normal world calling into secure world and stuff and that's kind of uh, what you're looking for is uh, those, those uh, pivots and uh, uh, when they're processing, you know, attacker user controlled data. Uh, so why? Uh, because they're, you know, critical <laughs> for security. Uh, it's a key component of your chain of trust and um, it's very obvious that a lot of uh, device designers are poor at uh, hardening and limiting attack surface. And what we mean by that is a lot of the devices we've looked at over the last year or so, uh, you'll find devices that have like full network stacks even though they don't need a network stack. You'll have um, a bunch of code loaded up to handle file systems that are never expected. So it just it doesn't really make sense uh, why they're not limiting all that attack surface. There's also a huge underestimate of uh, reverse engineering. Uh, people just kind of assuming that there's no bad actors and nobody's really going to look at this thing and um, and it's this hidden black box that that we should ignore. And uh, a little uh, story behind the presentation is um, we're actually on a train going to a baseball game. I was trying to introduce Ilya to the lovely game of baseball. And um, we were talking about uh, U-Boot and I pulled out my phone and we went to the U-Boot GitHub and in about, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we ran into like 10 bugs <laughs> and we went, yeah, we should probably audit some of this stuff. And um, uh, kind of uh, inspiration from a previous talk that Ilya has given at Congress where he audited a bunch of different uh, BSDs. I said, eh, why don't we look at a bunch of different bootloaders? And um, so um, just to give credit where credit's due, um, we are not the first to look at any of this stuff. So this is a list of people that um, kind of inspired us, have done really interesting work. Um, and we recommend if, if you're interested in any of this and, and you enjoyed it, you should go, uh, you know, check these people out and see, see things that they have, uh, you know, released in papers and stuff like that. So uh, where are they? Uh, bootloaders are pretty much uh, in everything. Uh, you, you have your workstations, phones, uh, game consoles, your TV, you know, everything. And uh, generally the security basically depends on this. Uh, so it obviously really, really, really matters. 
And uh, so with that said, we basically uh, started looking at these common um, open source bootloaders. So, you know, U-Boot, Coreboot, Grub, CBIOS, uh, Cafe, which is Broadcom, iPixie, and Tiano Core. And um, we're just looking at what's on GitHub, what we, what we downloaded. Um, obviously, in your real world scenarios, the devices that you have at home or go by and start looking at, they're going to be uh, heavily modified. They're going to have uh, weird custom drivers that aren't available, um, things like that. So, you know, we're, we're not here to argue the likelihood of some of the bugs we found. We're not going to argue exploitability. Uh, half of them, we don't, we don't know if they're exploitable. We, don't. we will for one. Yeah, we will for one. Uh, we don't really, like, that's not really the point of it. The point is to kind of show people, um, show designers what, what they should be concerned with and show uh, interesting, uh, or researchers that might be interested what, what they should look at. Uh, so uh, U-Boot um, is a extremely common. It's in a, a ton of devices. There's a huge, uh, very customizable config uh, for all different sorts of boards and stuff. Um, there's um, concerns for environment variable stuff. There's a super powerful shell. So you'll sometimes see even uh, shell injection concerns uh, based on environment variables. It's, it's, it's pretty funky. And there's um, lots, of, lots of drivers for tons of devices. So it's kind of a great like, first step of looking at something that kind of covers uh, a huge uh, breadth of, of things. And uh, so features of U-Boot that are interesting would be you know, network stack for its, uh, different protocol parsing, uh, file systems. And uh, they, they also will load their next stage um, images from like all sorts of weird like archaic things that nobody uses anymore. Um, and it's just used by tons of devices. And then uh, core boot, and I apologize, this is a little uh, dry right now. <laughs> we'll eventually get to this stuff. But, uh, but core boot, um, you know, it's more targeted towards uh, modern operating systems. There, there aren't uh, like legacy BIOS support. Um, it actually, they, they took a methodology that, that other projects don't, which is they're not going to implement features that they don't want to. So if you're trying to do network booting or something, you use core boot to boot into like iPixie or something. They're not going to implement that feature. Uh, these are used in Chromebooks, and uh, obviously some of the interesting parts are, uh, come from Google. And uh, one main interesting area is uh, SMM. And then Grub, uh, obviously you guys are all uh, familiar with this. Uh, the primary concern here is uh, multi-boot spec, and they support just a ton of file systems, so that's uh, obviously the attack surface you'd be concerned with. Um, but the interesting part here is that there are UFI signed versions of Grub. So uh, that's kind of like your secure boot uh, break right there. If you find a vulnerability that's an assigned version, you can now load that into your UFI and, and exploit that vulnerability, and, and you're good to go. And then CBIOS uh, is the default BIOS for Kimu KVM. Uh, this uh, supports uh, legacy BIOS stuff, so you'll see that this gets booted into from things like core boot. Uh, this supports uh, TPM communication, so that's kind of interesting. And uh, it's the compatibility support module for UFI and OVMF. So. And then Broadcom uh, Cafe. So this is used in a ton of different uh, like network devices and TVs and stuff like that. And uh, the obvious attack surface there would be uh, network protocols, the network stack. That's what you'd want to look at. IPixie, uh, this would be more, more network-based stuff, uh, various parsing. And similar to Grub, there's UFI signed versions. So um, it's a great potential pivot for secure boot stuff. And then uh, finally, Tiana Core. Uh, there's uh, really no introduction needed here. There's been a ton of great presentations over the last like 15 years. Of people just uh, you know doing doing everything to this thing. Um, and due to that, since it's pretty much the most scrutinized one out there, uh, it's it's really mature compared to everything else. Uh, so when you bash Tiano Core, realize that it's way better than everything else. <laughs> So, uh, and there's a lot of uh, like implementations built on top of it, like platform specific stuff, uh, Qualcomm's um, ABL and XBL, things like that. So you'll have all these, uh, you have the base, base Tiana Core EDK2, and then you have all the custom stuff built on top. 
And then uh, related to bootloaders, we have things like uh, Trust Zone, and that's kind of where I mentioned uh, you have like normal world and secure world. You all have these uh, interesting pieces of code that are running into those those secure areas that you're going to want to look for. Um, you know, pivots into there so you can gain access to to secrets. And then, um, and obviously from the host operating system, the the attack surface there would be you can modify things like uh, NVRAM. So you can uh, set variables that when the next time you reboot, the bootloader is going to uh, process those variables. So. And uh, this slide's more for reference. Uh, later, you can get the slides or take a picture or something. Uh, these are just uh, links to some instructions for building and and whatnot. So if you wanted to start looking at these, you can quickly build a uh, a little environment and and poke around. Uh, so uh, just uh, really quickly to go through, you know, the concept of secure boot. You kind of have your your chain of trust. You'll have the boot ROM that will then verify and load uh, various other stogers, uh, loaders that then verify and load the next thing. And uh, you'll sometimes have a TPM involvement. You'll have some trust zone involvement, and then uh, OS interaction stuff like the OS uh, basically setting things like NVRAM, which will set uh, you know boot boot. Uh, you know, configuration stuff, whatnot. So, uh, the boot ROM itself is uh, something you've probably uh, seen the talk by Cordy Oryup, uh, I think, earlier. That was. Um, it's really important uh, because uh, it can't be patched. Uh, it's um, a hardware revision would be required if if a vulnerability is found, and um, and it's so early. In, in the stage, and you would uh, basically compromise everything after it. That is uh, where where you'd want to go. Um, it's extremely bare minimum. It does uh, some initialization of, of hardware and memory stuff, and then um, you'll find things like uh, maybe implementations of fast boot. So you have a USB stack. So that's uh, obvious attack surface you'd be interested in. And then it will, you know, verify the signature of the next stage, and then boot that. And then you move on to the to the next stages, and this is where they start initializing the the rest of what's necessary: network stacks, SMM handlers, and whatnot. And they'll basically just keep keep handing off. Um, and then you'll run into things like trusted boot and measure boot, um, which is you know a verification and then measuring, which is kind of more for for logging and and whatnot. Doesn't actually mitigate anything; it just kind of alerts you of stuff. So. Um, some some hardware environments are, are a little different, like the secure world stuff. You'll have ARM or Trust Zone. Uh, Windows has VTL0, VTL1, uh, hypervisor stuff, and then, um, yeah, I'm basically repeating myself. And then eventually the the operating system that's going to get uh, the kernel's going to be loaded. It's going to be verified, and then eventually start running, and and then you can have fun. So um, early observations is uh, everything we pretty much looked at that's open source. Uh, there's no privilege uh, separation. So if you were to compromise a, a piece of component, you pretty much uh, rule everything. And uh, what's interesting is there are some proprietary bootloaders that uh, you're starting to see, like uh, Apple, for example. Uh, they're doing some some aspect of privilege separation. So if you were to to exploit a portion, you didn't necessarily uh, control the world. And uh, so, uh, right now, at least all, all the stuff we looked at did not have anything like that, but maybe in the future we'll see that. So, uh, this is the list of the attack surface that we think people should be interested in and, and focusing on. Uh, you have NVRAM, file systems, and files, um, all network stack protocol stuff, all various buses, uh, you know, SMM, DMA, and, and hardware stuff. Um, the the interesting thing about buses that we've noticed is that embedded designers seem to inherently trust anything that an end user should never interact with. So they go, okay, an end user uses USB, so we should verify some of that, but they do a bad job. Um, but uh, an end user doesn't play with the uh, spy flash, so just uh, inherently trust it. Or an end user isn't the TPM, so just if the TPM says something, run with it, and, and they mess it up a lot. So um, NVRAM, uh, these are the various environment environment variables that can be configured, um, you know, pr uh, for the next uh, boot cycle. And uh, like I said, it's basically processing of user controlled data. So if you start looking at uh, some of these uh, bootloaders, here's the interesting functions you'd want to look at. Uh, for example, in uBoot, you just kind of call for environment git. 
and grep through, and you see them grabbing the environment variable and see what they do with it. If they're not uh, doing any sort of validation, you're, you're going to hit a bug. And so an example of that would be uh, right here. You see there's an environment git for boot p vci. It checks if it existed. It will then do a stir length and then just mem copy it directly into a buffer without validating that it uh, can fit the buffer. And uh, this is actually kind of funny. Uh, earlier today, we were like, ah, we should try to exploit one of these just to, to show it. So uh, we, we toyed with this one and, you know, just threw, threw a bunch of bytes and it starts just kind of sending these weird packets over the wire and um, a, bunch of, a bunch of boot P stuff. Uh, you'll see later on, you just have full raw packets of, of whatever payload we send. Um, but it, it wasn't very. Uh, 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 realistic. It kind of went started getting into like the Kimu like network implementation stuff. So we so we kind of avoided and moved on to a different bug. But, um, but as you can see, it's it's very very easy for you to start looking at this stuff and and being interested in it and and quickly set up an environment and and uh, mess with exploitation and and we'll get into it. But there's no mitigations. Um, so as you see, um, there's a, a bit of a pattern here. Environment get host name, mem copy with stir length. Uh, no, no checks. Uh, uh, 128 byte buffer, environment go with boot dev, stir copy. <laughs> if I'll stir copy. You know, uh, it just keeps happening. Um, this is kind of uh, what we were talking about. It's just uh, the quality code is, is not, not very great. Um, this is, uh, what's funny is when we were messing with that uh, boot P VCI stuff earlier this morning, uh, we went, ah, oh, this is going to be more involved. So, uh, Ilya was like, well, let me just go find a different bug. You know, 10 minutes later, he's like, oh, I found a different stack smash. Okay, let's, let's work on that one. Uh, it, it's just uh, like this is a perfect example. They environment get the, uh, the variable, then they'll grab the very first element of that variable as a length, and then they use that as a length. And, uh, yep. And it keeps happening. <laughs> so, uh, just a, a quick uh, example. Uh, see this. So um, the the attack scenario of this would be you have a device, uh, you have NVRAM that you can physically modify because you have physical access, and this is kind of an example of the the default NVRAM. So we just threw you know an environment variable with 600 bytes, and you'll see towards the bottom there's four bytes where we threw we threw a function in there, and that's that's the address. So. Um, <coughs> Just uh, this had to do with the JFFS uh, two uh, file system uh, uh, loading. So you do you just do uh, FS load, and mm. it's done. So, that shell uh, code being executed. Uh, so this is. Oh. Yeah, sorry, I can't see. Uh, so obviously. Um, if you've never looked at this stuff, um, it's kind of fun to, to play around with, and you should uh, you should start poking at it because uh, why not? And screenshot. Sweet, cool. Okay. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so that was uh, the uh, NVRAM attack surface, which is uh, usually the most fun to play with. Um, programming the spy flash sometimes may take a little bit of fiddling, but in terms of uh, attack surface and fun things to play with, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, as Joe said, often overlooked, and so it's easy to toy with. And so you saw all those sprintfs and mem copies and string copies. Um, so uh, there's a lot of fun there. Uh, but obviously, it's, there's not just NVRAM. There's more attack surface to uh, um, sort of a, a, a trusted boot environment. Uh, and obviously, one of them is the file system, right? Because this thing needs to boot, and it needs to find images, and they, they're stored somewhere. And your file system sort of brings order to that chaos. And um, so basically, you need to mount your file system. Um, and often, file systems are uh, not signed or integrity checked, or not all of it is. Uh, because before you can do that, you need to be able to read something, right? Um, and so, uh, obviously, um, a, a, an example of a common file system would be the FAT file system. If you know if your boot environment supports um, loading your USB drive and for storage, uh, it's probably going to be FAT. Um, depending on and, and the Flash itself may have its own proprietary format, or it may use X2 or you know something else. Um, but clearly, the file system parsers. I mean, that's prime attack surface. Uh, closely related is obviously the files inside of your file system, right? Now, depending on what your boot environment looks like, um, some of these files are going to be in, uh, um, 
uh, integrity checked, uh, but some of them might not be, right? And so those file parsers uh, are interesting attack surface. Um, and if you're either looking for bugs or you're building a product, um, we would highly recommend fuzzing these. And uh, it's like starting with AFL is probably a, a good starting point. Um, uh, but we'll show some examples of some bugs we saw in certain, in a number of uh, bootloaders. Um, so we'll cover X2, uh, we'll cover so, uh, a, a bitmap splash parsing one. Um, I think the other ones are just sort of examples of where there could be bugs, but those two we'll cover. Um, so this is this is Grub and this is Grub X2 and Grub X2. You know, uh, this is the the symlink code. So it looks at the file system and it goes, oh, okay, this is a symlink. How do I parse the symlink? And so the symlink says, hi, I'm a symlink. I'm a symlink. I'm this big. And uh, what uh, Grub does is, oh, great. Uh, I'll, I'll add. I'll allocate that much size, but I'll do one more for a null byte. And of course, that is a, a, tr a classic integer overflow. Um, and the Grub memory allocator um, actually returns a valid pointer uh, for a zero size. So this is uh, a perfect primitive. So you get a pointer to something that is of zero size. Um, and then it actually reads the, um, the symlink content from the file system into a zero size buffer. And obviously, that's going to cause memory corruption. And a primitive, you can't see it here, but a primitive is really nice because uh, that particular read function actually, if, the, if there's, if it's, if there's no much, much more than disk, it stops reading. So, it, so even though you can say f read four gigs, uh, you can make the layout so it only reads, let's say, 1,000 bytes or 100 bytes. And so you have this uh, near perfect primitive um, to cause memory corruption. Um, this is uh, this was in Tiana Core, for example. This was the uh, bitmap splash screen parser, um, and I don't know if you know the uh, uh, anything about bitmap internals. It's a very simple format, but basically you can have a, a four-bit bitmap, and that gives you a palette of uh, four by four, which is uh, 16 bytes. And so the idea is, if you have a four-bit bitmap, then it has a 16-byte palette, and so it goes and reads that 16-byte palette, except um, you. You tell, it, you tell it how big the palette is, and you can say, okay, I know you're expecting a 16-byte palette, but I'm giving you a 256-byte palette. Um, and it'll read it into a 16-byte buffer. Um, <laughs> so that was broken. And then for the 8-bit bitmaps, similarly, it was broken the same way. Um, um, and these, these are, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many, many more. This, does not, this did not take long to find. Um, but let's, let's, let's move on. Um, obviously, okay, now that we've looked at some local stuff and some physical stuff, what, what about what about remote? You know, how how do we? Wh wh what is there, right? And obviously, if you're talking remote uh, in you know the modern world, you're talking TCP/IP, right? So you need a TCP/IP stack, and you need to have some services that you either expose or that you have client code for that you go talk to, right? And that's BootP and DHCP and DNS and uh, you know iSCSI and NFS. And if you're in a corporate, if you're a corpnet, you probably want to have IPsec uh, and then HTTP and HTTPS and TFTP, right? Um, and uh, sure enough, you know, most bootloaders have code for this. Um, and then you start asking, okay, well, what's, what's the attack surface? Um, you know, for TCP IP, if you implement your own stack, uh, well, A, good luck, because you're going to screw it up. Uh, but secondly, it's like, okay, well, if you look at these things, you take a step back and say, okay, well, really, this is all mostly TLV parsing. Um, and so you go and look into, like, what are the sort of the, the uh, the things that can go wrong if you do TLP, TLP parsing, and you know there'll be out of, out of bound reads pretty much everywhere, and you'll you'll see endless loops in lots of places and things like that. Uh, if you look at the, the protocol on top of that, um, like DHCP and DNS, um, you know you, you can uh, you have sort of your standard sort of network attacks where you'll see like lease stealing or uh, cache poisoning or things like that if you don't protect your ID. So if you have a static ID or you don't validate your IDs or you generate predictable IDs, you know you can ha you can have uh, these kind of uh, poisoning, stealing, man in the middle attacks, right? Uh, and then uh, thirdly, uh, obviously, you know, the thing we, we really like to see uh, is uh, memory corruption bugs. You know, you, at the end of the day, you, you take network data and you parse it, and if you do it wrong, you may cause memory corruption bugs. Um, another uh, some, sometimes overlooked uh, interesting bug, I think, in, uh, when you're doing network parsing is when you have information leaks. Uh, so this, this often manifests itself. Uh, I mean, Heartbleed, of course, was one example. It was a, it was a perfect primitive. Um, but generally, it's, it'll be this thing where you, know, you end up generating some kind of packet as a response to something, and you know, you, you'll have done a memory allocation, but for some reason not initialize something, and so you s end up sending uninitialized data over the network. Um, so th this is sort of the common things you see in network stacks in general. Um, so if you uh, 
uh, are looking for uh, these kind of bugs in a, um, a boot environment or if you are building a product that does this, I would highly recommend fuzzing them. Um, there are numerous interesting network fuzzers. Um, if you're looking for network stack fuzzing, I would recommend ISIC. Uh, it's pretty old, but it's still incredibly, incredibly effective. Um, it, tends to, it tends to break most ne uh, network stacks. Um, so with that said, uh, let's show some examples. Um, I was uh, so uBoot, for example. This is this is the uBoot DNS code, and if you, if you see that, that's the uh, TID, that's the DNS ID, and it's basically they give it a they use the static DNS ID of one for all DNS packets that they send out. Um, so doing DNS man in the middle uh, on a, a uh, uBoot environment is extremely trivial. Um, you you guess the D, the DNS ID by saying that it's one, and you are correct 100% of the time. Um, so this is Broadcom's uh, coffee, and this is the, the, the DHP parser, and it basically has this sort of this junk stack buffer where it just needs to read something out of a buffer, uh, and it goes and says, okay, well, get me the length of that thing, and it's a U and eight, so that means it can represent zero up till 255, and then it reads zero up until 255 into that junk buffer. So that's a, a stack corruption right there. Uh, if you then look at the coffee, um, a TFP uh, um, parser is very similar, where in this case it has a 512 byte buffer, and then uh, it basically um, copies the entire uh, RX buffer into it. And this is for Ethernet, so up to uh, up to 1500 bytes gets copied into this 512 byte buffer again, causing memory corruption. Um, obviously, we're not done with coffee yet because it has uh, such beautiful code. Um, so this is the the coffee uh, ICMP ping handler, and this has this really cute sort of uh, use after free bug or double double free, where it basically it sends out a ping and then it sits there receiving. Uh, the, you see the while loop there, and it basically sits there receiving uh, packets until it finds the right one. Uh, but it also, because it doesn't want to have an endless loop, it has a timeout. And there's this interesting condition where if the last thing it looked was the packet you were looking for, but it also timed out at the exact same time, it frees that packet twice, uh, which obviously uh, can lead to memory corruption. Um, again, we're not done with coffee yet. Um, oh, right, there we go. Not done with coffee yet. So this is the, uh, this is the IP handler in coffee. And if anybody uh, has ever looked at an IP header, which I would assume most of you have, you'll know it has an IP header length and a total length. Uh, and uh, of course, coffee needs to know this because it needs to know where stuff is. Uh, but coffee validates neither the uh, IP header length or the total length. Uh, so once you start messing with those, um, coffee blows up really fast. Um. So uh, that was sort of a, a quick overview of all the trivial TCP and TCP related bugs that show up in your average bootloader. Um, so, but let's say, let's say you got that covered and let's say, you know, okay, what's, what's the next thing? What, what, what more sort of network stuff can we do? And then of course what comes to mind is Wi-Fi, you know, 8 or 11. Um, and uh, a surprising number of bootloaders don't have 8 or 11. Um, so I don't know if that's sort of a sort of on purpose or just sort of the we didn't we didn't get to having this feature yet, but we will at some point. And obviously it'll have bugs when we implement it. Um, but uh, we, we did find one that has it, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, one thing I did want to mention is that um, if you look at 802.11, uh, like frame parsing, uh, depending on which device you have and particularly which radio your device is using, um, it, that you'll have radios that do a lot of parsing on the radio, in which case the stack is kind of covered because it's, or at least you hope it is, where the radio does a bunch of validation. Uh, but then there's a whole bunch of radios that sort of, you know, they take packets from the wire and they just don't do anything and just pass it on to the OS. Uh, that's the stuff that's interesting from, uh, from attack service point of view if you're looking to attack the bootloader and not the, the firmware. Um, so uh, yeah, we looked at Pixie, iPixie, and uh, of course, you know, Anytime you do any kind of uh, Wi-Fi stuff, the first thing you do is you, you're looking for an SSID, right? This is what this thing does. And you know, it sort of uh, has this SSID buffer, which uh, an SSID can be up to 32 bytes. So that is 32, well, it's 33 bytes because it's 32, 32 plus one. And it has this loop uh, where it sort of goes over IEs that it gets. And then it, when it finds the right S, uh, the IE for an SSID, it says, okay, we'll take this IE and we'll do IE length. And IE length is a U and 8, so it can be up to 255. And it copies the SSID IE into the SSID buffer, which is only 32 bytes, uh, causing uh, memory corruption. Um, so uh, that's iPixie for you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the next one, if you're thinking networking, would be Bluetooth. Um, and Joe and I have actually, we've looked at proprietary bootloaders that have. Uh, 
Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth support. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't talk about those bugs because they're covered by non-disclosure agreements. And we tried really, really hard to find a, a similar equivalent in any kind of open source bootloader, and we couldn't find one. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't give examples of uh, sort of uh, Bluetooth uh, bugs in uh, open source bootloaders. Uh, but I do kind of want to, in general terms, talk about what we have seen and where we suspect the bugs are going to be if somebody does do this in, a, in an open source bootloader or so, somebody implements a new bootloader. Um, so, uh, and also, there, like, if you're going to do Bluetooth in, in a bootloader, it's, it's usually for, you know, HID device, right? This is for keyboard and mouse. This, this usually ends up being for consumer devices. Um, but in general, if you look at uh, a Bluetooth stack and you're looking for any kind of, you know, parsing bugs, there's three sort of recurring themes. Uh, there's three sort of recurring themes that we saw when we looked at the, the Bluetooth stacks that we have. Um, and this is if you look at the lower la layers like L L2P cap and things like that. Uh, and this is usually related to uh, sort of uh, uh, frames and frame lengths. So very, very large frames. So a, f a frame can be up to about 65,000 bytes because the length is a, a UN16. And so if you create really l large frames like right up to the edge, uh, that tends to uh, blow up Bluetooth stacks. The other one is if you create very, very, very short frames, um, you know, less than what something is expecting, that tends to blow, blow up uh, your Bluetooth stack. And then lastly, uh, because L L2 cap can have fragmentation, so you can have individual fragments that you all add together, and every fragment can be X amount of bytes, but the whole thing can be up to 65,000 bytes a byte, uh, 65,000 number of bytes. Uh, so if you start playing around with the fragmentation, um, we've, numerous Bluetooth stacks have blown up. Um, again, I wish I could have shown um, uh, an actual bug here, but um, I, I wasn't able to find any in the open source uh, uh, bootloaders. Um, so moving on to USB, um, this, is, this is a prime attack surface um, in, in bootloaders, obviously. Uh, if you haven't followed the news in the last couple of weeks and months, um, this has shown up in a, a number of devices. Um, this is, uh, at least up until recently, I think was sort of under underreported or sort of people didn't quite care about it. Uh, but to me, the USB stack is like the, that's the, if I, next, anytime I look at a USB loader, at, at a bootloader, my, my first thought is, you know, NVRAM and number two is USB, right? And USB is interesting because uh, obviously a lot of bootloaders support USB because they'll use it either uh, for storage or, you know, things like Ethernet dongles, but often for storage. Um, where, it, you know, either you expose certain files or you try to do some kind of recovery boot from USB or something like that, right? Um, and so, um, basically, if you start looking at how USB works at a slightly lower level, um, it, it, it's not quite, like, it's not like, PC, like PCI, it's, it's more packet-based. Um, and so what happens, they, um, when, when a, a device talks to a host, the device is asked for quote-unquote descriptors. <coughs> And these descriptors uh, say certain things about your device. And based upon the number of descriptors that the host asks from you and all the answers you give them in descriptor responses, uh, the host ten, uh, can then figure out like what kind of device you are and like um, what class you are and what functionality you expose and all these kind of things. Um, and so a lot of this, these descriptors end up, you know, being parsed and being parsed wrong. Um, and so generally, uh, we often see either straight up overflows or double fetches. Uh, because the way descriptors work is they're variable length uh, content, but the headers are predefined. Uh, and the way it works is you first ask for the header, and then based on the length in the header, you ask for the thing again, except uh, the USB protocol doesn't allow you to just get the the payload, you have to reread the whole thing, so you have to reread the header that you already had. And so in most implementations, what happens is you go get the header, you allocate a buffer, and then you go get the header and payload again, and you overwrite the original header, uh, what me which means is you get to overwrite the original uh, header length. And so uh, you can uh, have a talk tau where your device gives you a header with a, a good length, and then the second time it gives you um, a descriptor with, with a bad length, and if your host doesn't validate that both lengths are the same, uh, bad things happen. Um, and yeah, straight up, <clears throat> straight up overflows happen too, because um, nobody ever expects the USB device. Um, <clears> There's <throat> an example in Grub, for example, um, where it goes and gets a descriptor, and uh, the descriptor says, oh, here's my config count. I have, th I have this number of configurations. Go and fetch those in the descriptor as well. And uh, there is a predefined uh, array of 
number of configurations that Grub has, and it doesn't correlate that with the config count. It just always assumes the config count is less to or equal to the array. And so if you have a malicious device and you say, hey, uh, I know your array are two bytes, uh, two, two elements, but I'm going to give you 64 uh, configurations, it'll happily write 64 configurations in a place that can only hold 32 of them. Uh, and exactly the same thing for number of interfaces. Um, uh, Tiana Core had similar bugs where um, this was Tiana Core where they go and get a descriptor and then the descriptor length says, okay, now go fetch me the whole thing and use that descriptor length. Um, except the uh, the original hub descriptor uh, was a very small struct, and the descriptor length is a uint eight, so it can send up to 255 bytes, and so that would have uh, smashed memory and caused a, a stack corruption. And so, as you can see here, the the fix here wasn't actually at a bound check, but just to make the buffer bigger, because you know the length is uint uh, eight. So if you just make the buffer 256, then any length you any length you give it um, will uh, <clears throat> will fit within the buffer. Um, hold on. Yeah, this is an example in, in, uh, in uh, CBIOS where this is the classic double fetch where it goes and gets the header, does an alloc based on the header, and then uh, gets the header again with the content, and it doesn't verify that uh, config w total length is the same thing as CFG to w total length. And because that verification isn't there, whoever calls this thing can no longer trust w total length because it could be invalid. Um, and so as, as I said, um, USB to me is one of the prime attack surfaces to um, secure boot. And so I want to sort of very, very briefly mention uh, two recent real world cases where devices got broken into because of USB parsing in the bootloader. So this was, uh, this is a case of um, the Nintendo Switch, the, uh, the, the Tegra. This was done by the fail overflow people uh, about a year or so ago um, that basically, you know, you uh, give it a, a length that's not validated and then a mem copy and that causes memory corruption. Uh, and then the recent iPhone checkmate, uh, this is slightly more complicated because it wasn't a straight up memory corruption but it was, you know, if you fiddle around enough with the state, it sort of gets out of sync and it has all these pointers that it's still considered to be alive but the memory has been freed and so you end up, this ends up with a user after free but it is because of a sequence of USB packets that are being sent. <clears throat> right, so that's it for USB. Um, Obviously, a uh, bunch of the buses, uh, or almost any bus on your device, uh, if, if, uh, if your boot chain uses it, is interesting attack surface. And this is uh, spy, I mean, spy flash shouldn't be trusted. SDIO, I2C, LPC, uh, even, even your TPM, right? Even your TPM response you get back from TPM can't be trusted because somebody could desolder your TPM and pretend to be your TPM. And if you don't now validate the data you get from TPM, you end up with memory corruption. Um, so this is, for example, what happened in CBIOS. Uh, CBIOS has this uh, talks to the TPM and it goes and gets this uh, structure and you can send it less than what it expects. Um, and then uh, basically they, they subtract some side of a struct minus uh, um, less what they, what they expect and so that causes uh, um, uh, integer underflow which ends up with a really big size and then that size is given to uh, malloc and malloc internally has an int overflow so that really big size then becomes a very small size and then they copy into it and that causes memory corruption. Um, and uh, so this is a combination of two bugs, right? One is where the sizes are wrong and then secondly is where the malloc has an in, in, inter, internal integer overflow. Um, and this is the, 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 this is the, the malloc internals of CBIOS which I don't want to dive into now because it's pretty convoluted and complex. Um, I'll leave this as an exercise to the audience to figure out where the int overflow is. And technically it's not an int overflow because it's a bunch of shifting being done but it, it essentially comes down to an int overflow. Yeah, there we go. Tap, yep, there we go. Okay. So another service, uh, attack service that is interesting but uh, um, often overlooked on devices except for UFI um, is uh, system management mode. Uh, and I mean there have been over the last decade and a half numerous, numerous presentations about SMM attack surface and, and breaking SMM handlers um, for UFI because it's, it's an x86 thing and you see this in UFI stacks. 
Um, and it, it was a sort of cat and mouse game where for years, you know, somebody breaks something and then Yuffie fixes it and then somebody breaks it again and Yuffie fixes it again and somebody breaks it again and Yuffie goes, okay, let's do a mitigation for this. And this has gone on for like 15, 16 years. Um, and occasionally people still find bugs, but by and large, Yuffie does fairly well now with regards to SMM handling. Um, there's some third party stuff that still breaks occasionally, but in general, they got a handle on this. Um, now, what, what if you're using x86, but you re-implement your own bootloader and you don't use Eufy, right? Well, that means you're going to run into all the same problems Eufy had, and you're going to screw it up in all the same ways, and you, it, it'll take you another 15 years to get it right. Um, but I guess, I guess if you uh, were to try it the first time, this is what Core, Core, Core Boot does, and uh, to their credit, uh, they say, oh, we get input, we should range check it. And their range check says to do. Okay, um, so uh, now I, I, I talked about a bunch of buses. Um, the, the, the thing to me that sort of separates that from, from other things is when you do DMA. Generally, for, for as long as DMA has been around, the idea has been DMA is game over, right? If you get DMA, then, you know, that's that. There's no trust boundary. Obviously, that's no longer true, right? We have IOMUs, and if you use them, and, and if you have a device that has this uh, available, then all of a sudden DMA uh, can be stopped, it can be uh, contained, it can be regulated. Um, and so uh, it, it's no longer a sort of game over and you can implement a trust boundary. A uh, few things there. A, if you are an embedded device and you're using an IMU, you are way ahead of the curve because not, not that many people are doing this, right? You should, uh, but it takes some effort. Um, there's obviously many different IMUs. It uh, depends on your architecture and sort of the, the board you have and all sorts of things. So Intel has VTD, ARM is SMMU, AMD has like the device exclusion, and it's got a few other ones as well. Um, but basically, if you use one of these, um, you can sort of, DMA is no longer the game over. Um, now, that, mean, that doesn't mean that, you know, you, you're in the clear. Um, once you define DMA as an attack service, you have to defend it. Um, and, and that's where you get some difficulty because you'll end up using drivers that have been written before it was a trust boundary. Um, and I mean, no one has ever written uh, a DMA handler and, uh, with, trust, with a trust boundary in mind because, um, because you assume that there's no trust boundary. Um, so now, well, son, if you start using the IMU, you have to go back at all your drivers and look at, okay, where am I doing DMA? And now I can no longer trust what, what in, what's in, when I get back from DMA and you gotta go validate all this stuff. Um, but even if you do all of that right, which by the way is very hard and you probably won't do it right, but let's say you do, um, secondly, uh, because DMA is now a trust boundary, um, anytime you open up a, uh, a memory window for a device, you can't just open it up. You have to clear the memory first because otherwise now you're leaking memory to a device, right? So all these sort of new things sort of uh, uh, show up if you take DMA as a trust boundary. And let's say you do that right, well now you still have a dependency on the IOMU because you are assuming the IOMU is perfect when it probably isn't, right? Um, I, haven't, I haven't really gotten to this part yet, but I, I, one of my plans for the future is to go look at IOMUs and see if I can you know, attack IOMUs and, and find bugs there. I, I strongly suspect there will be side channels and logic bugs and maybe, maybe even some hardware implementation bugs. Um, so, uh, bug-wise, this is where it sort of gets designy, right? So this is this is this is what this is Ufi today, it's EDK2 platform code, where it has support for IMMU and they're ahead of the curve. Um, but if you look at the spec, um, there's no good handover protocol from um, from Ufi to the next stage, and so Ufi basically boots up and very early configures the IMMU and makes sure that devices can't. Uh, can uh, uh, peek or poke arbitrary physical memory, and then it get, does all of its stages, and then it's about to hand off, and it goes, well, I don't know if the next guy supports IMMU, so it undo undoes all the IMMU program it does, turns the thing off, opens up everything, and then hands it over to the next guy. So all the, you did all this work for nothing. <laughs> um, and this is, this is a spec bug, uh, and it's, it's being worked on. People at Intel are very much aware of this. Um, people at Apple have fixed this for their devices. Um, this is going to get fixed in the future, but given that this is done, um, has to be done by spec, you know, it takes a while because you have to get people to agree to it and then have numerous different implementations uh, implement this. And uh, this is where I hand it back over to Joe. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, hardware, it's uh, pretty much out of scope for the presentation. We did not uh, look at any of this, but we thought it would be naive to not at least uh, mention it to people. And uh, what, we, what we mean by that are like glitching, side channel, silicon stuff. And uh, so with uh, glitching, you have like fault injections. Um, and uh, a lot of times people go after things like the signature verification stuff. So they'll basically glitch that part and then they'll start running unsigned code. And a recent example of uh, some glitching was done by Fell Overflow for the uh, PS4 SysCon. And uh, I forget the specifics, it's been a while. Really, really good blog post you should check out. Uh, but I think it went to like an infinite loop, like, oh, go to debug mode or something, and it would say, uh, that's not enabled, infinite loop, and then they just glitch out of it, and then it initializes debug mode. And uh, so uh, stuff like that, obviously, um, should be uh, concerned with. Um, then, then clearly side channel with timing discrepancies, uh, uh, power discrepancies, uh, things like specter meltdown, uh, speculative execution in general. Um, uh, these are where people are leaking secrets, right? Going after keys so they can start signing their own code, <coughs> stuff like that. And then uh, chipsec, and this is um, somewhat interesting because it's. Um, Obviously, only uh, relevant for a very sophisticated attacker. It's going to be somebody who has very expensive equipment. Uh, they do things like decapping. They use fibs and, and sems. Um, they can do things like optical ROM extraction and get the boot ROM and then start auditing that and then and then you know find a bug and exploit it. And uh, obviously, totally out of scope for the presentation. But uh, one thing that's uh, interesting about this is kind of kind of presently, it's it's still you know. Not a lot of people have this expensive equipment, uh, but I think uh, very soon you, you have people like uh, John McMaster and stuff who who have like a sem in their garage, right? And so you're going to eventually start getting these uh, regular hackers in their garage that will eventually get this equipment um, as uh, the older equipment becomes more affordable, and um, and maybe that opens us up to to more uh, realistic instead of. Uh, people just kind of ignoring it, and they go, "Eh, I'm not worried about somebody with you know a quarter of a million dollars worth of equipment." Now it's turning into somebody who dropped 10k or 15k. Uh, and then uh, you know, quick uh, note on uh, code integrity: um, it's it's something that people mess up a lot. It's uh, kind of hard to do right. You have people that do uh, weak or, or crypto. Um, you have blacklist problems and. Um, an example of that is, you know, there's finite space for their blacklist. It'll eventually get exhausted. So when you have stuff like where I mentioned that you have a signed grub, there's a, a known bug in, in a signed grub uh, binary that was released by Kaspersky. And um, if, if that's not on the blacklist of your Eufy platform at home, you can just load that up and then exploit it and you just broke secure boot. Like, and it's not going to get fixed until that platform has an up-to-date blacklist. And eventually, if all this crap gets blacklisted, eventually that list will be full and then they can't blacklist it anymore. All right, so it's, it's a, there's a concern there. Um, and then you'll have issues where they, they'll only sign like certain portions, not, not the full blob. So you can uh, you know, still modify certain parts or sometimes you'll see uh, they'll just check for a signature existing, but they don't validate it. You know, really, really dumb, dumb stuff. Um, so uh, conclusions. Um, obviously, this is the uh, tip of the iceberg. Um, there's a lot of stuff we didn't look at, and if it, if it wasn't clear, we did not uh, really audit these things. We uh, we literally would. Uh, like chat with each other every day and be like, hey, uh, we need a C BIOS bug. Like, okay, give me an hour. Okay, I got one. Okay, check the box and then let's move on to the next one. Uh, we, we, our goal was to have a, an example of a bug for each list of the attack surface, an example of a bug for each list of the thing we looked at, and that was it. So, um, you know, once we found one, we stopped. Uh, so you guys should, uh, you know, go hunting and, and have fun. Um, but if it, if it wasn't obvious, there's a, a surprising amount of low quality code. Um, it's, it's kind of crazy. And uh, it's pretty clear that not a lot of people are looking at this stuff. And uh, one thing that, that kind of sucks is you get to uh, NDA hell really, really, really quick if you want to look at uh, any of this proprietary stuff. So if you're interested in uh, Qualcomm stuff, for example, and you want to get some documentation or, or look at it, um, you pretty much have to sacrifice a firstborn to uh, get access to that stuff. Like, it's just not going to happen. And it's, uh, it's kind of silly. Um, so 
um, you know, kind of like our advice and uh, call to action is, um, you know, people should be minimizing their their image, their uh, boot environments, their host host environments. Um, you know, turn off uh, features you don't need. Uh, if you don't need a network stack, why have it? If you don't need USB, why have it? Um, all you're doing is enabling attack surface for somebody to to leverage. And uh, something that we see a lot, which is insane, is like these little embedded devices that are running Linux and they have literally more drivers than our, our desktop at home and it's just like what is going on here? It, do it doesn't make sense. So uh, you should really, really, really work on limiting the attack surface. And uh, really quick, uh, mitigations. Um, there aren't any in most environments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there just aren't any. Um, as you can see from the example from before, um, that was like, you know, just from this morning, just really quick. Uh, you know, smash and uh, you know, over at uh, the stored PC, and and that's it. Like, there's no ASLR, there's no no anything like that. Code flow integrity, whatnot. Uh, but uh, there's a link to a GitHub, and that is an Intel employee that have bas uh, has gone and implemented a lot of these mitigations that are uh, moving into Tiano Core. Uh, so they are way, way, way ahead of the game of everyone else because they're actually getting uh, a lot of these mitigations, which is uh, quite impressive. And you should you should check it out because it's interesting code. Uh, so kind of a, a call to action. Um, we we really hope that this was uh, inspirational. Uh, to, to a few of you if you've never looked at this stuff and it was always this black box that you weren't, uh, weren't, weren't sure about, you should just start poking around. Go, go find the slide where we showed where the, the uh, you know, build instructions were and go build some of these things and, and mess around and, and you're going to have fun. And, and like we said, with no mitigations, you can work on some, some easier exploit dev stuff and, and it's cool. Right? Um, but it, it's clear that a lot of people need to be uh, reviewing this because it, it's, it's clearly not happening. Uh, people should start fuzzing interfaces. Uh, everything we kind of showed should have been found with, with basic fuzzing. Um, we're kind of at a point where, where I just said, uh, I'm just going to take like a teensy or something and, and have it just, you know, do that, that classic descriptor uh, double fetch because uh, I think we've seen that in like every USB stick. Like, like, like it just, like just make a device and just start plugging it into stuff and just watch it break. Um, uh, and then obviously periodic reviews and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you. Now we have about ten minutes for Q and A. And we will start immediately with the internet. Thank you. Has the grub issue been fixed yet? And was the code unique to grub or borrowed from, you know, elsewhere? Uh, I don't think it's been fixed yet. And uh, this, was the, this was from whatever the official grub repository was. All right. If you have a question in the room, please line up at the microphone so I can see you. And now microphone number two, so, please. So let's say you want to make a more secure laptop. So you can to take Core Boot, take a static uh, kernel so that everything is in, compiled in, no, no, no modules. But what about the text, uh, text surfaces that, let's say, somebody tries to um, interrupt the um, line of uh, while it is booting, for example, that you maybe some, somehow get into make a, maybe DMA access because you, you somehow uh, interfere with a, let's say, Broadcom network device that has some special firmware to optimize the traffic or something, and that, it, that this thing gets buffer overflowed, uh, uh, buffer overflowed and makes some problems on the, on the bus or something. Uh, so are you talking about attack surface from devices? Yes, that's like that. So you, you, yes. Let's say you, you want to make a good system, so I think the best you can do if you have a laptop, that you take a core boot and you take a Linux, that you completely compile without module support, everything you want to have is in the static kernel, and then just boots. And the kernel is in the core boot, and so mm -hmm. it's in the flash. Uh, but, but you can get problems by, 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 let's say, some devices that just uh, spit into your memory because they can do a DMA master. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's definitely a concern. Um, and that's one of the things we, we were like, okay, well, if, 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 if you do use DMA as it has been forever, then, that, then it's game over. Uh, luckily, nowadays, we have IOMUs. So you, depending if which situation you are in and what hardware you have, you can configure your device to use the IOMU. 
And if you're doing that, um, then even if a certain hardware device is compromised, you can still try to protect you know, your CPU and your host from the device by having the IOMU. Um, that I think, I hope it answers your question, but it's about as good an answer as I can come up with. So, so, that's the, so, so this is the maximum you can do against uh, some attacks? Uh, I mean, from, from a device? Let's um, say you want to make an extreme hard laptop that you use in an extreme hostile environment. Say again? You want to make a hardened laptop that you use in a hostile environment. Right. I mean, I think that's the best you can do, right? Um, I mean, you can go and look at your host OS and look at how it parses the stuff that comes from the bus, because there'll be, there'll be bugs there, too. Uh, but I think that's the best I can come up with. Yeah, I mean, uh, you minimized uh, the attack surface as much as you can, right? And then once, once you have it as minimized as possible, then you just kind of uh, hope, <laughs> hope there's nothing there. But you don't, then, you don't need the code signing because you have everything in your flash. Or you still need some, some stuff. Oh, you mean the stuff that runs on the host? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, obviously. If you, if you, let's say you have a core boot on the Linux kernel in, in the flash. Uh -huh. And so everything is like we have, let's say, eight And you maybe take flash. this discussion uh, okay. after the talk okay. because we have more questions. Thank Good. you. Thanks. Um, Signal Angel, please. What is your favorite disassembler um, that you use while reverse engineering the bootloaders? <laughs> Uh, well, we didn't really, we just looked at source code. <laughs> uh, we we um, used to be in a few places. Yeah, I mean, like... Uh, uh, I mean, for this, per <laughs> partic for this particular, uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, most of it was white box, so we didn't have much, except for the exploit, we didn't have much need for, um, di for a, a, a disassembler. Uh, I guess a little bit of GDB. Uh, in general, when we do do uh, reverse engineering, um, I mean, I does, I does my yeah. go-to. Uh, I've been playing around with Gidra a little bit, uh, it looks promising, um, has undo, which is nice. <laughs> um, but uh, th those are usually, and then, you know, for doing Linux app stuff, GDB is nice when you're do de doing debugging. Uh, but generally, Ida. Microphone number one, please. Um, I have two questions. Um, what's your opinion on the ARM trusted firmware architecture? I'm, um, I have to work with this, and I'm a little bit shocked. Um, in my opinion, <laughs> it's a little bit overcomplicated. And the second question is, um, should we not also question the boot ROMs? Because um, what I've seen in this special project, um, it leads me to believe that the boot ROM is also very broken. Mm -hmm. And then is the question if it's um, really necessary to harden the other stuff anymore. Right, yep. Yeah, th those, are, those are really good questions, by the way. It sounds like you're working on this. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, well, your first question was what again? Um, what do you think about the ARM uh, trust right, firmware architecture? Yes. <laughs> um, I, 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 like you, I, I've touched upon it in a few engagements. Uh, unfortunately, um, any of the concrete stuff I can't really talk about because it was covered by non. Yeah, I, I see you aware this this problem. Um, but I, I, ju I share your opinion that there are some things in there that are troubling. Um, uh, with regards to the boot ROMs, you are spot on, sir. I mean, this, we, we try to bring this up in the, one of the slides is if there's a bug there, you can't fix it. Hardware revision is the only way to fix it, so you're kind of screwed. Um, th there are some designs you can do to try to minimize it. So you could say, okay, well, you can, in your boot ROM, in your boot ROM you could have a feature that allows for, quote, unquote, patching the boot ROM where you can have a piece of something on storage that could overwrite what the boot ROM is supposed to do. Obviously, up until that point, whatever's in the boot ROM, Still, you can't fix that, uh, but you can, you can minimize the amount of stuff in the boot ROM that's not patchable, um, but you can't minimize all of it. I mean, there's gonna be some of it that is locked, burned in hardware, and can never be fixed for that device. Uh, I, I'd love to hear of a better solution. I, I don't know of any. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, this kind of touches on uh, when we said people underestimating uh, reverse engineering. They kind of just keep it super, super black box, and it's this secret thing. And then, uh, you know, when f somebody finds a way to, to dump a boot ROM, they start looking at it, then they just see, you know, a bug in a USB, <laughs> USB stack, and then uh, the switch goes down, and, or the iPhone, or what whatever else, right? Uh, so, so, yeah, it's, uh, for, from my perspective, it, I, I would say it would make more sense to do more open, open auditing and let more eyes see it instead of uh, hiding it in the corner and, and pretending like, well, it's okay because nobody's looking. Um, that's that's at least my perspective on it. I, I know why why people are su super secretive about it, but uh, you need more eyeballs. So maybe if you've got the right context, uh, as, uh, my wish would be to get blank chips, so I could um, flash them with my own boot ROM. 
So I have a, 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 a method to improve things and, and keep the attack surface minimum. Yeah, and then there's going to be two other arm dies on there that are circumventing everything that you just did. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Do we have more internet questions? Um, yes. Are you aware of any good and maybe even free bootloader fuzzer? Ooh. Uh, no. not, not, in, not, not in its whole. I, I, did, I mentioned a few places. Um, so uh, if you're doing any kind of file-based stuff and you can isolate it, uh, AFL is, you know, that's the go-to these days. Uh, for network stuff, there's a couple of interesting ones like ISIC and there's some Wi-Fi fuzzers and, and I think there's, you know, some DNS fuzzers and things like that. So that works. Yeah, um, I, I would say the, the best way, in, in my opinion, would be to pull out the interesting components that are doing the parsing and, and the stuff you're concerned about and write a harness for that. So you don't really need to, to try to write a fuzzer for that environment. You can just pull that feature out and, and harness it up and then l let it you know, run on a bunch of cores. And yeah, so I think lib fuzzer might be very helpful there. Yeah. All right, number two, please. Uh, hi. Will it help producing the uh, occurrence of such errors by using another programming language like uh, um, that would feature more secure um, um, things at compile time or during runtime, like uh, maybe Rust? Mm -hmm. Would it help? And if yes, are there alternative projects that use other languages other than C? Do, do I'm not aware. Oh. Uh, so I, I, I think you're right. I think we can uh, reduce the amount of, especially the memory corruption stuff. I mean, if we, you switch to something like Rust, uh, even though I think on occasion there's some Rust corner case that shows up where something doesn't get caught by the verifier. Those are weird corner cases. In general, yes, I think you're right. If we switch languages, um, the memory corruption, a lot of memory corruption stuff goes away, um, but not everything goes away. All the, the, the design stuff is still there, right? So, currently doing that, though, right? Well, so there was actually there was a talk by Andrea Barisani oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yesterday or, or the day before where he's doing a, a Go runtime for an, uh, as, a, as a base for an ARM device. Um, so this is an avenue that is currently in the beginning of being researched and being worked on. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, I think it's a direction one that we could go into. Uh, I think there's something there. Um, at the present time, it still seems a bit too early. And the other thing is that while it does reduce the num num number of bugs that are going to be there, in particular memory corruption stuff, um, it doesn't, like there will still be, you know, th your logic bugs and your hardware bugs and things like that. Um, so it's not a silver bullet, but it could definitely help. Okay, and we're out of time. Please thank our speakers again.